We're chatting with a phenomenal female founder, a genuine disruptor in chief who is dedicated to addressing food insecurity through a program focused on ensuring access to fresh produce for those in underrepresented communities and creating systems of sustainable agriculture. That's right. We're talking local farming and teaching folks how to farm for their fresh produce and how to bring it to the table. And you will love meeting this amazing educator, organizer, social innovator, and a connector with a focus on youth development. And wow, does she have delicious startup stories to share with you. So stay tuned to the Startup Life Live show. Let's glow, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Startup Life Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, four times founder and startup champion to founders around the world. And after raising four businesses of my own, let me tell you, I am in awe and wonder of you getting up every day, figuring out all the problems that you're facing, staying strong during those moments of the dark night of the soul and and celebrating, really honoring how well you're doing those tiny little milestones along the way. So this is me clapping wildly and cheering wildly for you. And I'm truly grateful that you carved out time to tune in and up your founder game. Because as you do better, your startup does better. And there's really no better way to learn some really good insights and strategies and grab some inspiration than tuning into the Startup Life Live Show. Because that way, you're going to get some insights you may not have thought of from the conversations that we have with wonderful, diverse founders, investors, and experts here on this show. Um, if you are tuning in via the podcast. Oh my gosh, it would be great if you could subscribe and share this conversation with others that might be interested in this conversation. And if you're tuning in from the YouTube channel, please click on that subscribe button and don't forget to smash the like button while you're there and to receive links on all the platforms so you can hear the most recent episode of The Star of Life show and be uh, get the deep background in each of the guests, come on over to the Startup Life Meetup Group. That's right. It's a wonderful place that you can get a, an announcement, an alert, an email whenever I post a new show. And if you are a B2B business, there's nothing better than getting certified as a woman-owned business through WeBank. And that's if you are a female founder and you own more than 51% of your business, there's money on the table for you. With the WeBank application, there's government contracts, there's corporate contracts that want to do business with you, but they use the gold standard and that's WeBank. All right. Now, if you've hopped on WeBank and said, I got this great, but if you get on there and you go, oh, hell no, please shoot me an email, andy at andylyons.com. I can help you. I've helped dozens of women from the stage of like no revenue and barely even a balance sheet to show, right? To 80 million a year. Okay. I've helped all types of industries from iron workers and machine toolers to product, food, consumer packaged goods, services, and everything in between. So please reach out and say hello and see how I can help you with that application, okay? All right, so I am so excited to introduce you to our amazing guest today. And I'm telling you, she has remarkable stories, especially from the nonprofit angle, and that is Valika Brown. She founded E-Roadmap Corporation, a nonprofit that works with after-school programs, school systems, and various organizations to empower and equip youth with life-altering unique skills to eradicate poverty of mind. Oh, how, how wonderful is that? She recently launched a new program called Operation No Food Gap, which focuses on ensuring access to fresh produce for those in underrepresented communities and creating systems of sustainable agriculture. And you can find Felika in the classroom at the local city hall or on the front lines feeding the homeless. Oh yeah. This is a woman who is there to change the world and make it a better place everywhere she glows. Let's bring her into the room. Hey, Felika, 
Welcome to the Strive Life Live Show. So happy that you're here. Yay. Best edification ever. So happy to be here, Andy. Oh, I'm delighted to have you. But I heard about everything that you're doing. It's just so remarkable and so empowering and so important. So, Felika, tell everybody where you're sitting right now. Where are you physically, geographically? Well, I am, yeah, right. Oh, I'm in my living room and I'm in <laughs> West Palm Beach, Florida. Wow. Okay. So you're in a state that needs you more than ever. Just saying not to go there, but I'm so happy that you're there keeping things focused on what's important, which is our youth, their mindset, how they view the world, how they feel empowered, but also talking about this wonderful new way of helping people understand that there is a dire lack of accessibility to fresh food, grown food. And of course, it's the old proverb, you know, you can give someone a fish, right? But when you teach them to fish, it's a whole different ball game. So let's dive in a little bit into your background because you launched uh, eRoadmap quite a while ago. So tell everybody your launch story. Had you been an entrepreneur before? Were you exposed to entrepreneurs? you know, with role models, or were you that person hustling product in third grade? Share your launch origin story. You know, I wish I was that person hustling product in the third grade, because maybe, hey, I'd be more prepared. But I was the person that was fortunate enough to have mentors in the home. So my dad was this entrepreneur. He had a painting and wallpaper company. And his story is interesting because his father taught him how to paint. And my grandfather was illiterate. He couldn't read, he couldn't write, he couldn't recognize his name on a piece of paper, but he passed on the skills that he did have, which was painting. So my father started a painting and wallpaper company. And so I saw the hustle and the grind from my dad, yet my mom is an educator. So from that side of the family, here it is, I'm learning about communication skills, working on being articulate, reading books. Um, so I had some preparation there. But, you know, in terms of how the nonprofit started, I was in business. I was an entrepreneur, you know, been an entrepreneur for over 25 years now. And during that time, yeah, I was selling products and and I started reading these books and having exposure to some other mentors. And I'm reading the books and the philosophies by Jim Rohn, Les Brown, Zig Ziglar, all these great people, um, Earl Nightingale. And I'm reading oh, yeah. the books. And I'm, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so can I'm we just say a shout out to Les Brown? I could just play Les right. Brown all day long you know, and be right. inspired yeah, to do more. If anyone needs anything, if you need to push a button, activate it play some less brown. But but I didn't have the exposure to these mentors growing up. And so I'm sitting here in like a parallel world um, as an entrepreneur, but I'm thinking about the next generation for whatever reason. And it hit me in 2007. I said, listen, I need to start a nonprofit to teach entrepreneurship. I need to teach kids these philosophies and mindsets to shape their thinking. And so back in 2007, I just wrote it on paper. A hundred back in the day, you know, a hundred type pages of what I was going to do, how I was going to do it, what I wanted them to learn. And I just went from there. Oh my gosh. Like the vision came into your head and got downloaded. Right. Right. I mean, you think about it because here I am, you know, I'm early twenties and I'm coming out of college and I'm learning about being an entrepreneur, but I'm reading things that are just causing my neurons to fire. You know, the light bulb is going off. And I knew coming as a black person in a community, you know, we're just not exposed, unfortunately. Most black people don't grow up with the libraries in their home. You know, they may not even grow up with going to the library and reading books and having these mentors. And even if you don't have them in, the, in your home as a mentor, going to the library and adopting them as a mentor. So I just felt like it was my responsibility to teach and share. Well, and we're for... First of all, we're so happy <laughs> that you did that. But also, when you do listen to the Les Browns of the world, folks, you feel a calling. You feel like, okay, yes, I could set up a shingle, but is that all I want to do? I need to do more. I need to change lives. I need to make this world a better place. 
how can I do that? What lights me up? And that's why I'm always talking about what's your North Star? Because when you have that level of passion to get you up every day during the, yeah, as I'm talking about too, the dark nights of the soul that only entrepreneurship can provide, <laughs> you know, you are being compelled by a bigger vision and mission than your own personal needs. And so how has that worked? Because since, you know, you launched in 2007, that's a long time to be under the same umbrella of a business and a mission and a vision. What has sustained you through those times? Well, it's interesting because I started in 2007 on paper, but, you know, we'll talk about the challenges of funding a nonprofit. So there were early challenges. And I said, well, listen, I had to get back out here and sell something. You know, if, if I don't sell, I don't eat. So let me get back right. and I'll repeat this. And, you know, life kind of got in the way, but really life just happens. And then in 2013, I revisited it, set up a board. We received our 501c3 status. And that's when I kind of just hunkered down and said, listen, I got to do this. I started doing workshops locally. And then when I moved to Florida, we just went all out because it's just such a need, you know, just such yes. a need. Plus, you've got a good environment for growing, too, but also for helping people. And we'll talk about you know, the, the no food gap uh, operation in the future. But first, let's talk about launching a nonprofit because, you know, folks, you can you can go ahead and file, get your tax ID number and start getting donations and bringing money in. But there's still this process of setting up a board. It takes months for all the paperwork, IRS, et cetera, to go through. What was that like for you, especially when, yes, you may be the, quote, founder of the nonprofit, but you're not the owner? What was that like? The interesting thing is, and, and I'm sure a lot of your viewers will agree, sometimes you know what you don't know, but the more you research, you realize that there are things you didn't even know that you don't know. And that's it's what happens to me. here at the Start of Life live show. We're always like, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> right. You know. And so for me, I knew getting into the nonprofit space was totally different than corporate America or being an entrepreneur in business. So I started off going to the library. Now, of course, you know, it's online and things of that sort, but I'm just old school. You know, it's something about going to the library and seeing what type of resources are available. So I had to research any type of trainings that were free and that were available to teach me about board governance, to teach me how to write grants that taught me how to connect, how to shape your mission statement, your vision statement, and just started putting it all together. And it's, I mean, you're, you're always learning. You're always growing in my mindset. I haven't arrived. You know, there's always something else to figure out. But in the beginning stages, you have to dedicate the time to do the research because it's not the same. The rules are totally different. And it, it, listen, totally different. And I just kept putting one foot forward and I kind of figured it out. And, you know, you continue to fail forward and, you know, oh my we can, gosh. We can that. Yeah. And I, of course, I love that you went to the library and I'm going to figure this out. And then you're like, what? I've got it. What? And especially that board governance piece, you know, who do you on board? Will they say yes? And then what if they're on board and then you're like, rut row, <laughs> they're not as good as I thought they were going to be. How do I off ramp them? Yeah. You know, there's all of these things that happen. Yeah. You know, the whole way do you, you know, you bring in donors and their funds and nurture those relationships year after year, getting the new ones, inspiring new ones. People kind of stroll through and, and show up sometimes for a chapter. Sometimes they're for, you know, the whole book. But what was that part like as you started to sit down with your board and you started to talk about your vision and your mission and how they can help and making sure you gave them the right marching orders. What was that conversation like? Well, your board is going to change. So if you have people listening and they're interested in the nonprofit space, my first board was my first board. Your number one mistake you make is your board. Your first board is probably going to be your friends and family members. And that's okay, you know, because you're still figuring it out and you need some people who are in your corner who support you, who, you know, would tell you keep going. But as you grow and you understand your vision and where it is you want to grow to and 
uh, looking at your operational budget to figure out how much money I really need to get there. Then you realize, oh, I need a different type of board member. <laughs> so, you know, now it's a matter of going out and networking and letting people know who you are and, and getting involved in their missions and making yourself seen because your board can can really help or hurt in the nonprofit mm -hmm. space. So give us a hurt moment so people can go, oh, I feel yeah. And yeah, that sounds like something I went through. Well, you know, a hurt moment can be a lot of different things. A hurt yeah. moment can be where they have the skill sets to help and the connections, but they don't. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about that until you start working with them and seeing if they're going to do it. You know, right. um, another hurt, another hurt moment can be when they really don't believe in you. You know, sometimes you can have a board member who thinks they're everything. But the board, my board chair reminds me all the time. She says, Velika, the board is here to serve at the pleasure of the CEO. So I have an amazing board chair. But sometimes board members don't think like that. They think you always need to be led. So it's true. Oh, wait a minute. Can, we, can you just say that again? What she said, the board is at what? Yeah, the board is to serve at the pleasure of the CEO. You know, they're there to support, you know, but nonprofit you know. founders take that in, please, because it's so easy to find yourself becoming obsequious to your board members, especially if you've got some high profile board members on you kind of like, you know, giving them the bow, <laughs> genuflecting. And when they really need you need to be a leader, you really need to step into your CEO goddessness and say, hey. This is how, this is the mission. This is what I need from you. And how about setting those expectations? You know, when are you going to meet? How did you figure all of that? You were a young woman. It wasn't like you'd already done this or you'd worked for a nonprofit before so much that you understood all the ropes and all the challenges. You had to figure out how do I communicate? How frequently? Share with us how that came together. Well, for me, I was just very transparent. So here I am moving to Florida. So no one knew me anyway. The people in Florida had no idea who I was. They didn't know my background in terms of the business. So I knew first and foremost, I had to get out here and network. And so I was networking and anyone that seemed like they were the deal and was nice to me and smiled at me, oh, you were my friend. And before you knew it, you were on my board. And um, that wasn't a proper way to do it, but that's how it happened, right? And um, then, you know, they had a meeting with me and they said, well, Velika, you know, it's really not the proper way. Because these are, and, and I suggest that people get individuals on your board that are older than you. So the average board member for me is 20 years my senior. You have some people younger, you have some people right there. So you can get a lot of viewpoints and you need to be guided and just being transparent. And I said, well, listen, I, hey, I've never had a board, but I know you're making things happen. Let's put it together. And we figured it out. And so I had to do some more research in terms of the protocols. You know, right. you had to right. But even within that, you can figure out how often you want to meet with your board. We meet, you know, once a quarter. You Perfect. know, because I have, yeah, I have so much going on and they do too. And you you don't want to stress out your board members because most of them are probably on another board. Right. Yeah, I know. So they, yeah, but I will say at this point, Andy, to your guests, what has helped me is always learning and growing. I'm an avid learner. I'm big on professional and personal development. So I continue to work on myself. I've continued to, you know, I mean, I've gone to Harvard. I've, you know, gone through classes at Cornell, Wharton, um, any type of certifications I can get in nonprofit. I do that. Also, because I know who I'm looking to attract on my board. And if the CEO is not willing to invest in themselves, why should they partner with you? So that's very important. Oh, my gosh. So everybody, I've got two I've got to do a real clap for. First of all, always be learning and growing founders. That's a stitch that on a pillow moment, right? And then the Andy-licious moment. I'm just having a back-to-back -back here, uh, Valika, and that is... Oh my gosh, you know, not just upping your game, but also preparing yourself, you know, being willing to take those extra courses, finding the time to learn so that you can attract 
the best board members because they're going to take a look at you folks and they're going to have some criteria themselves in being, you know, giving up their time and energy for an organization. They're going to take a look at that leader, the CEO and say, okay, is she doing that? Yes, she is. So the Andy Lish's moment, everybody, hold on. Thank you for that excellent advice for current nonprofit leaders, as well as those who are thinking about establishing a nonprofit, you know, utilizing the resources out there. And Valika, this is one of the, I'd say the number one ingredient I have, after interviewing, you're my 243rd founder I've interviewed in the last three years. I have to say the common thread is, you know, figuring out the problems. All right. Just finding the solutions and being curious and unstoppable about that. Right. You, you know, go to the library, take these courses, make those mistakes and being willing to make those mistakes. So important. Let's talk about one more area before we go on to talk about the no food, no food gap initiative. And that is when you were first starting out versus today, working with donors, with corporations, individual donors, you know, it's a mindset. It's a, you know, a passion, please, and play. How did you figure out and what, what was it like initially and what is it like today? So initially it was a lot of Googling, you know, <laughs> looking up um, donation letters. What does it look like? Support letter. What does it look like? And just seeing what was out there, recreating it and sending it out myself. And in the beginning, you don't you don't have any sponsors. They don't know you. And all you need is money, you know, because you're trying to fund your mission, you know, let alone trying to carve out a salary for yourself. So in the beginning, it was a lot of Googling, figuring out what to do, so on and so forth. Um, now it's pretty much a lot of networking, you know, really just networking and doing the work. You know, my mindset is if you build it, they'll come. So I have a different philosophy. You know, I'm just going to go out there and do it, you know, and I'm going to do it so big that you're going to hear about it and you're going to say, oh, my brand needs to be attached to her. So if you have the opportunity to do something so great, I challenge you, just get it done. Get it done with yourself, your family, your friends, um, volunteers, just get it done. And actually found funders will appreciate that because they'll say, man, look what this person has been able to do without any resources. Well, if I invest in them, that's a great investment. Ah, hooray, <laughs> clapping big time on that one. Absolutely. And what does network look like for you? Everybody has their idea. And sometimes for our introverts, it can be pretty scary. Me, you know, a room full of strangers. Come on, bring it on. I, I'm happiest. When I get to walk yes. into a room where I don't know anybody, what does networking look like for you? Well, I understand that because I'm an extrovert. I'm not shy, um, but my boyfriend's an introvert and, and he networks in business too. And, and I'll share things with him and he's like, yeah, I'm going to try that. I'm like, try it. Just do it. Okay. So what it looks like for me is one doing my research. You know, I'm not going to the mall looking at someone that has on fancy shoes and giving them my card. That, that's not what you do. You know, you go online, you find out what events are happening, or maybe there's a huge organization that's having a fundraiser. Now you want to go to that fundraiser because those are individuals in the room that support missions that maybe are writing a check. And then you introduce yourself. Hi. Well, first, if you know someone in the room that can make an introduction, a warm introduction, that's always best. If there's someone in your network that can make a warm introduction via social media or email, that's always best. But if you find yourself in a room um, with these potential funders and partners and sponsors. Hi, how are you? I'm Velika Brown. I'm with eRoadmap Corporation. Is it okay if I share some information with you through email? And I find that if I say through email, they're not as threatened versus if I say, let me have your cell phone number, you know, but one, <laughs> you know, you want to find you would out. Never hold back on saying that, but it works better to do the email. I, mean, I can just see you. Let me just hold your phone and put my number in there. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, for your extroverts, that's what you say. Get right to it. Actually pull out your phone, give them your phone, all of that stuff. But your introverts, you know, to say, hey, is it OK if, if I shoot you an email? Because now you have some contact information. 
Excellent. And so is that built up over the years? You know, what did you learn about your donor base? Because again, people come and go, they move out, they, you know, or they have different interests. They, be, you know, sometimes nothing gets opened. You can track that on emails for sure. But when you have, right. do you have fundraisers as well? Did you have like a, an event that you would invite folks to? And, and how you did know, you nurture those donors? Honestly, we're behind the ball with a fundraiser. So I want to let everyone on the line who's watching or listening now know that you can still succeed without an annual fundraiser. Now, I strongly suggest you have one. <laughs> I'm, I'm on board now about it, but you can make it without it. So for me, it, you know, it really was a lot of one, doing the research to find out who is funding. You want to find out who the players are in your city, in your county, and you want to find out what they're funding. Now, the tricky thing in a nonprofit space is this year they may fund hunger. Great. Next year they want to fund literacy. So now your operational budget has just changed. And that happened for me. I had an amazing funder when COVID hit and, and they're They've turned out to be a great partner, but they have metrics as well. So when COVID hit, they decided to fund um, our organization $100,000. Awesome. Next year, we're rocking and rolling. You know, I'm thinking that's going to come back again. No, it doesn't. So now you've got to figure out how to continue to do the same work with, boom, $100,000 less. So that's why you need to find out who's funding in your county what they're funding, and just apply, apply, apply. Send out a newsletter. So do we get individual donors? We do. Do we have some private donors? Now we've started to attract some private donors. So that's very exciting. And now we're into corporate sponsorship. So there are levels to it, you know, but you have to build a track record before those corporate sponsorships will come in. That's right. And, you know, and then there's grant writing. If you've got any bandwidth for that, that can always be a challenge. But I know, it, you know, I just kudos to the nonprofit leader. Yeah, you know, there's just so much, but it, it's so worth it. I'm so glad you were called to do what you're doing today. So that's why I want to dive into, I mean, because the initiative for e roadmap so powerful when we can empower our youth we're going to get much better citizens going forward, right? To work Absolutely. with in our government and all aspects of life. So now let's talk about Operation No Food Gap. I'm going to just put a little thing up here, everybody. No one should go hungry. And through the power of urban agriculture and community partnerships, Operation No Food Gap is working to ensure the most vulnerable in Palm Beach County have access to fresh, healthy, and affordable food. Join the movement. Go to nofoodgap.org. Nofoodgap.org. How did this come bubble up and become such an important initiative for you and E-Roadmap? You know, you said something in the beginning in terms of um, essentially just letting the idea find you, you know, and that's kind of how it works with me. You know, I look at a need and I work on the solution, you know, because initially right. when e roadmap started off, our focus was to teach entrepreneurship to you. And then when I moved to Florida, we expanded to health and wellness, financial literacy, etiquette. So we run etiquette academies. But when COVID hit, everything was about hunger. I sit on a hunger relief task force for the county. So I'm sitting with these huge organizations like the Food Bank, American Heart Association, and I'm hearing what they're doing. And everyone is addressing hunger the best way they can because it's a it's, it's a big bite to chew, you know? Right. And and hunger, let's let's identify what hunger is because folks, you know, there's some dead ingredients out there that people put in their body that do not provide any nutritional value, which causes the body to go hungry. So there's, you know, different types of hunger. What does hunger look like in your mission and vision? Well, what we realize is hunger doesn't look like what most people think it looks like. Most people yeah. think hunger is pretty much synonymous with homelessness, but that's not the case. No. You know, 
you you know you have you know middle america who's experienced homelessness and and hunger too homelessness right. and hunger because the prices of houses are going on up the rent prices are going up so now they're shuffling themselves and and then when it comes to hunger you have to choose do i want to pay my light bill do i want to eat and do i want to go get, to or my food? medicine yeah or my medicine and yeah. then do I want to go to Whole Foods or do I want to shop at the dollar store to try to put something in my bellies? And would I'm personally a, a volunteer first amongst everything. And whenever a person needs help for hunger, I'm on the front line. So one of my friends who just works really hard in a hunger space down here said, hey, V, I'm going to be getting these tractor trailers in during COVID. We got to get these food boxes out. Can you help? And I found myself driving like 30 miles one way because that was the demographic area we were serving. And I'm loading up the front seat of my car, the back seat, the trunk, you know, my mask on, getting these food boxes, driving down the street, door to door, knocking, giving people a box. Right. And people are smiling. They had their mask on, but you can see up there, you know, they're smiling and they're saying thank you. And. And I did that and I organized some food drives, too. But one thing clicked for me. And what I realized was, one, I didn't like the food that was in the boxes and did, did not, did not, yeah. um, I, because the food wasn't good food. It's going to turn around and bite you in the butt, cause all kinds of health problems. we got to do something different. And two, it was, two, people couldn't cook the food, meaning they would put things in a box like an eggplant or a butternut squash. Now, uh, most marginalized communities, unfortunately, are flooded with Black people. We did not grow up on butternut squash, cooking it, right. chopping it. We did not grow up on eggplant. So, you know, and then do they even have the tools to cook these foods? You know, do they have the the right knives? Do they have an oven? You know, it just didn't make any sense to me. And the bigger issue was this was a reactive approach. And so I sat home and I thought and I thought and I thought, I said, man, I got to do something. And I thought of Operation No Food Gap from a proactive approach. You know, we would teach people how to grow. But it was also started out of a need because during COVID, I got grants recalled. It was so crazy during COVID. Grants that I was awarded were recalled. Um, grants that were open were closing. They and I've heard now from some larger organizations, you know, Velika, we just really weren't prepared. We thought our goal was more so to shore up the larger organizations, you know, because then help them build capacity. I said, yeah, but you killed the smaller organizations. So I was in a place where no funding was coming in. I'm seeing this problem. What do I do? And um, I went out there and I took out some loans, some business loans. I purchased a truck. And I purchased a trailer and uh, my idea was to get food on the trailer, drive it around, give out gardening kits and teach kids how to garden because the kids are on Zoom. And that was crazy. I still wanted people to connect with the earth. And we started Operation No Food Gap, which initially well, essentially, we partner with cities and municipalities, take unused parcels of land and we grow. And one of the locations in 10 months, we grew 12,000 pounds of non-GMO organic produce and gave out to the residents. So it's just a full Wow. And, and for podcast listeners, we're looking at a bunch of beautiful photos of big, you know, <laughs> bunches of lettuce and carrots and probably some kale in there, maybe some, what else, What other, I mean, just everything. We have um, mustard greens, beets, um, carrots. We did grow butternut squash, <laughs> um, <laughs> collards, romaine lettuce, butter lettuce, everything. Well, and, and food that the community who needs it most feels at home with, where they have right. recipes that have been passed down generationally and how to cook and prepare this food. But to get it fresh like this is so powerful. And to understand, I mean, you're, you're solving so many problems at once like this, because you and I both know that one of the biggest challenges health-wise is this, quote, fast food 
that's available. It's cheap, a can of SpaghettiOs, whatever. No nutritional value, folks, whatsoever. It'll curb your hunger, but it really won't feed your body. And that's what I was talking about. There's hunger in the sense that you're trying to keep the lights on and get your medicine and you're trying to eat. And then there's, you know, the hunger of then feeding your body food that will not take care of it, will not nurture it, and will make you sick. And so what you're doing is just so systemic in reparation in the sense that you are helping people saying, hey, we've got plots of land here. And do you, do you bring the folks in, but our folks can just come by and get the food? How does that work? How do you feed from these plots? So the city that the cities that we partner with, we have like acres. So we have a couple of lots and we grow from like rows. They're in rows. So we don't set up like the raised beds and say, hey, this is yours. No, we focus on community engagement. So the residents come out and they volunteer and they help us plant. We plant by seed, we weed by hand, you know, we harvest by hand. And so now they are taking an active interest in their health, you know, in their community. And we partner with, this is where the partnerships come in. We partner with different organizations that can come in and help us provide wraparound services. So we do cooking demos, we do gardening, we do art therapy. We bring kids on the sites of the spaces we've developed so now they can paint outside. I mean, we, we just work really hard to improve the communities that we're in. Oh my gosh, you must get up every day and go, yay. And isn't it great? Yay. I mean, this is, this is the silver lining that we keep hearing about folks from COVID, right? That I was doing this and then COVID happened and oh my gosh, everything fell out of it. The, and then the next thing, there you are, Valika, out there building a whole nother level of community empowerment for all the generations. What's some of the typical, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it is very interesting because, again, I set out to teach entrepreneurship and we ran Shark Tank Academies in Florida and West Palm Beach and Liberty City and Detroit. We started, we did etiquette academies, we taught financial literacy, then boom, now we're building gardens for people and farms and creating solutions, you know, and we build fresh markets. So we literally create grocery stores in those communities to help solve um, and the, the stigma of them being food deserts. So it's, oh it's totally, it's, it's a 180 in some respects. Well, and yes, and but there's so much about your lived experience that prepared you for this, right? And, and it's also an incredible platform. When you think about community gardening, and of course, you're down in, in a part of geographically where you can probably do this year round, right? Right. Yeah. Mostly. There's, mostly. Yeah. So, you know, so you have this this wonderful opportunity to not only just, you know, bring in volunteers and, and be planting, growing, nurturing the plants and all that, but you're using it as a way to teach and to innovate and to um, raise the consciousness of folks. And it, it's, it's just a wonderful, rich way. At, at, and at the same time, becoming healthy health awareness, getting rid of that stigma of a food desert and make it a rich, healthy community who understands why they want to take the time to prepare the collard greens and do all of that and feed their bodies and, and educate them around that. And there's a level of worthiness, I'm sure that must come from this experience that's impactful. It is, it is. And the volunteers feel it. Um, you know, when we started off, we're on a main street, so it's a fence, and people would see people hunched over. I mean, in the summertime, I got to give a shout out to my volunteers. You're talking about the summer heat in Florida, and we are out there working. And so people would drive by, and they come in, introduce themselves, and then it would just keep coming. So we have volunteers that show up at 7, 7.30 in the morning without even being called because they appreciate the work. Some of the volunteers say, hey, Valika, this is my therapy. You know, some people come yes. because they have great conversations because we have two top rules. First rule, no passing out. Can't pass out. No passing out. You know, <laughs> and the second rule is no shop talk. You know, so we're not talking about who shot John and what happened at the water cooler. Like we're out here having some organic, authentic conversations 
you know, at the farm, which normally don't happen out just elsewhere. Oh my gosh. And there's really, and when you're partnered with some, you know, other people and you're weeding and you're doing all the things to bring a garden to its full fruition. And boy, there is nothing better than when you pick that tomato or pull up that garlic or, you know, the carrots or snip off the lettuce or kale or collard greens, mustard greens that you're going to be eating, right? There's just nothing better. And just going, wow, this live product is, I'm going to feed my family with this. And that's what they say. They say, wow, especially when you're growing in marginalized communities. They had, you know, one of the lots that we have used to be an old fire station. So, I mean, when we started off, I mean, we probably pulled off, pulled out a roof, all kind of pipes, everything, you know, and, but you have to prep the soil. And so we started working on the soil and, you know, we brought in organic soil and we brought in four dump trucks of compost and just making sure it was rich and doing you know, soil amendments. And so people that were volunteering from the neighborhoods would say, hey, B, you mind if I take this seed? Or they learn about propagation. And they're like, well, I'm going to plant this at my house. And they're coming back sharing the stories of what's happening at their home, what's growing at their home. And and it just changes the game. I mean, yeah. it changes the game. All of a sudden, container gardening becomes like very doable. I mean, right. folks, I'm a huge fan of container gardening because it's all in one location and it helps keep the critters out of it as well for me personally. But I haven't, I actually, we put our tomatoes and cucumbers and some lettuce in the front. So we pull into our driveway and it's right there. So you can just pick them off and go make a salad if you want, you know, or a sandwich. It's so wonderful. And you're teaching folks how to do this. Well, it's needed because believe it or not, most of the kids think that the only place you can, especially in the inner city, right? They think the only place you can get food is at the grocery store. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to teach them. Even peanuts, we grow peanuts. And it's weird here in Florida, peanuts can grow in a palm tree. That's so weird. But that is weird. Yeah, that is but weird. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we, we show the kids, OK, this is your area. You planted this. Now come back in two weeks, come back in two more weeks and look what happened. So it is amazing. I'm happy that we're doing this work. And like you say, sure, I feel fulfilled. It's a joy to wake up every day to know that you can craft out something right. that is enjoyable to you. Well, and I love that when the universe said, um, uh, Valika, we need you to do this now. And you were like, OK. <laughs> because that's what happens, entrepreneurs. You know that, that one minute you're focused over here and then things start happening and you're feeling called, you're feeling compelled, especially the nonprofit founders. You know, I mean, you, you, know, you learn so much from building the business like Valika has, and then you can easily transition or add another initiative like no food gap dot org. Everybody, you've got to visit that website and also go check out e hyphen roadmap on Instagram and Facebook and everywhere it glows because it's just such great information and such great work. I definitely want to connect you with build.org. Do you know the folks from Build? No, I'd love that. Oh, they yeah, they teach entrepreneurship to middle school and high school students. It's a oh, national right. organization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I'm th I'm thinking, you know, where do you want to go with this? Where do you want to glow with this? You're in Palm Beach County, but other counties are going to be craving this. How will you, what, what's your mission and vision to help expand? Well, in the nonprofit space, I will tell everyone, your challenge probably won't be coming up with ideas because you'll see the need. When I came to Palm Beach County, you would have never been able to get me to believe that they have a hunger issue here. But I remember teaching entrepreneurship and I couldn't even teach the kids until I fed them because they were so hungry. So even back in 2016, when I started teaching entrepreneurship down here, I saw that, you know, correlation. Um, you know, so as you start working within your field, you will be pulled and you will be led, you know, so there's not a challenge with that. The challenge is going to be capacity, building capacity, because you're so passionate about your work that you find yourself doing all of the roles. Whereas in corporate America, there is a CEO, 
there's that CEO's executive assistant, there's this person, then there's a program manager, and then there's a volunteer coordinator, and then there's a driver, you know, but hey, you'll find me driving a van, I'll do this, and, and I do, but I just encourage you all to just take a moment, take a pause, and, and ask yourself, you know, am I really, am I healthy right now? Goes into mental health, am I healthy? And you may have to scale it back a little bit until you build capacity. Boy, is that incredible advice right there. I'm feeling a founder journey moment coming on everybody for incredible advice. I'd like to get that extra because that's so important. Folks, you've got to remember you're very capable. Right. So many founders, so many leaders are very capable, but you can't do it all all at once. You can't. And I also want to encourage you all to ask for more money. Now, and I took a pause intentionally. So when I first came here again, they didn't know me. So even though I was used to commanding money in my mind, I'm new to nonprofit. I'm not going to ask for a lot, but you need a lot. And but you still need to prove yourself. So in the beginning, you know, you need to prove yourself. But when you get to a point where people are calling you and they're recognizing your work, you must recognize your worth and you have to ask for more money from your sponsors, from your partners, from your contracts. You have to Um, now to your question about how we're going to scale. That's where that's why I divert a little bit to capacity. We're getting the calls now. We're in the process of expanding down to Miami. I'm getting phone calls from Philadelphia about replicating Operation No Food Gap because it's a full model. I mean, our model, if people really knew it, no one's doing what we're doing. And so they want to replicate it. So it's good as an entrepreneur when you think of something that no one else has, but you have to build capacity to be able to scale. Right. And the systems and procedures and the foundation pillars in order to lift and make that happen, which is, you know, I'd love to introduce you to build.org and the wonderful women running that organization because um, they figured that out already. And so, and, but it's not farming, it's not teaching, you know, it's a different, but, you know, finding the right constituents and the right regional folks to run. I mean, that's folks, that's called leveraging partnerships and relationships that are so important when you're building a business, the collaboration that's involved. And that's what you see in the garden all the time. Collaboration, right? I I do. I was on a call yesterday, a gentleman from um, FIU and FAU, and he's doing hydroponics. He says, so-and-so said, and we just had a great chat because we are merging into hydroponics. That's our next phase right now. And it's always great to collaborate because if someone else has an interest in helping and growing and teaching, why would not collaborate? So, you know, you have to remember, like they say, you know, your candle, your light does not lose any shine if you put the light on someone else. So it's very, and in the nonprofit space, it's very important to collaborate. One, because it looks good, but more importantly, you learn. You don't know it all. You will learn. Oh my gosh. So who added wind to your sales? Can we do a shout out to somebody or a couple of folks that helped open doors, add wind to your sales, lifted you up during your journey? Well, I've had quite a few, you know, from my (laughs) entrepreneurial experience. So they're mentors along the way. And they, and I have some adopted mentors that don't even know me, Les Brown, Yes. Oprah, Michelle Obama, you know, but there, you know, Brene Brown is awesome too. Michael Beckwith, I heard you say the night of the soul. So yes, you know, Mm -hmm. all these people are great, but locally, I would say an or, and they know I love them. So I'm going to give them a shout out. There's an organization that bet on me in the beginning, Children's Services Council here in Palm Beach County. And um, but before then was youth services development. They gave me my first contract, but it was Children's Services Council that gave us our first fifty thousand dollar grant. And I'm telling you, when you're used to getting five thousand dollars, seven thousand, eight thousand, twenty five hundred, ten thousand, when you get a fifty thousand dollar grant, 
that makes a difference. So I certainly want to shout out Children's Services Council. And since then, we have some amazing partners. Uh, we have uh, uh, some private funders now and some people who don't want the recognition. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to everyone oh. who has supported our journey. Wonderful. And when you are going through some tough days, what mindset hack do you use? Because founders who are tuning in, that's part of the journey. And it's your job to figure out how to nurture yourself, how to use a mindset hack to get you out of the funk and get you out of bed. Because the funk is going to happen. <laughs> and it's not always good funk. And so you're going to have those days where you're like, I am a loser and hashtag why bother. When you're having those days that when you're feeling inadequate, what do you do that works? Valika. Well, my ritual has has always been I'm going to pray and I'm going to meditate, you know, and yeah. then I'm going to do some yoga. I might go to the gym now. It, but personal development has been the key. You know, when I started off early as an entrepreneur, I mean, they drilled that our leadership drilled that into us, which is awesome. We grew up doing about, believe it or not, eight hours a day of personal development because it was drive time university. And when you're in sales, turn your car into a university. So if you're out there to our founders, you have to put something great in because what goes in must come out. And if you're having that negative self-talk, it's going to show your shoulders are going to be hunched. You know, you're going to be, you know, over, you're not going to be confident. You're not going to be able to make eye contact with people. But if you're putting in that positive self-talk, even if you don't feel it in that moment, it's going to come out. And then that's going to happen because you got to remember, you have to feel it first, then it comes. You know, people that's say, right. when I get a million dollars, I'm going to be excited. Now you got to get excited to get that million dollars. So that's right. You got to feel it first is absolutely right. I love that advice. And folks, everyone, you don't have to buy the audio books. Everything you need is on YouTube to listen to yes, or, yes. Or, on, or on TikTok for the shorter bites of inspiration. But really, it's so easy to go down the pathway of all the negative news and all the tough things that we're all fighting for here, especially in the U.S. But and, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, all of that. But you know, I invite you to take Valika's advice, which is to listen to some Les Brown, some Michelle Obama, some Oprah, some of the mentors out there that you love that talk to your heart um, and can help you because as hard as it is, once you turn that on, even if it's just for a few minutes, it will help shift your mindset. Thank you so much for that great advice. How can the Startup Live Show community help serve you and your initiatives in the world? Give us some calls to action and marching orders. Well, you know, I would say go to nofoodgap.org. Check us out. Our social media isn't the best, but we're working on it. So still follow <laughs> us. I'm, I'm actively working on that now. We are in the process of raising funds to build a hydroponics facility. So if you have connections or you like information or you'd like to donate, please do that. I mean, just stay connected. You know, you can sign up for our newsletter on the website. And I would just say share to everyone, anything you've heard that you may have enjoyed hearing about Operation No Food Gap, just spread the oh word. Oh my gosh, that's so great. I'm so delighted you joined me on the show that you carved out time out of your busy schedule to share your incredible nonprofit founder journey stories with us today. Thank you, Valika. Any last words before I pop you in the green room? You know, Andy, I want to say thank you. And to everyone who's really interested in the nonprofit space, I want to say you can do it because nonprofits are those gap organizations that fill in the need and the void where maybe government and school can't help out. So if you have a vision to serve and to help, don't give up. Just go for it. Oh my gosh, that's the best advice ever, as we would say here in Boston. That's perfect <laughs> because you know it's so important. The role of the nonprofit so important. Thank you, Valika, for everything you're doing with eRoadmap and NoFoodGap.org. It's such an important initiative. Food is our friend, especially when it's live and it's fresh grown and goes right to the table. And I'm so grateful that you are here to share your story. Thank you. Thank you. 
Oh my gosh, we learned so much from this phenomenal female founder. Be sure to connect with Valika on LinkedIn, follow everything that eRoadmap and uh, knowfoodgap.org are doing and you know, add some wind to her sales. And if you have any questions, you know, reach out to both me and Valika. We're here to help you and help you up your founder game. So before I log off here, I just want to remind all of you that you know, as you're going down this journey of founderhood, right? Please promise me that you will remember that you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem. And as we say here in Boston, you're wicked smarter than you think. Ah! <laughs> keep going, keep glowing. Be sure to like and share you know, the video and the podcast so we can reach more founders out there and inspire them to keep going. Join the meetup group so you can get an alert whenever a new podcast is posted. And of course, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I'm so grateful for your time and your presence. Please stop by on social media to say hi. I'm always around sharing the delicious advice and glow. Until then, until I see you again or share with you here on the podcast or the video, I'm wishing you a delicious day everywhere you glow. Mwah, everyone from Boston. <laughs>